Good evening, everyone, and most welcome to Uppsala Art Museum and this panel talk, Involution and the Aesthetics of Resistance. Uh, so Involution is a new commissioned work to the Uppsala Art Museum's collection, and it's uh, the artists behind the, this piece uh, are present today, uh, Christel Lundahl and Martina Seitel. And we're so happy to be owner of this piece and to be able to show it to, to uh, an audience for a few weeks uh, at the museum and hopefully also to lend it to other institutions and museums in the future. Uh, so Lundahl and Seitel, um, the, their multi-sensory practice is influenced by choreography touch and narrative, often incorporating advanced technologies. As a viewer, we are drawn into various mental states. Lunda Lecetis aesthetic program strives to touch us on a deeper level, where human life relates to a context of other living organisms. The work in evolution explores how far we allow ourselves to get involved. And in this talk today, we will also explore the links to uh, the novel Aesthetics of Resistance by, by Peter Weiss, because it's also part of the installation in, in different, um, different aspects. I will also say that we have a beautiful panel here. We have Stefan Jonsson and Devin Suber, and, uh, who will discuss this theme with Lundahl and Seitel and also Susanne Fessé, who's a curator, freelance curator and art historian and writer. Um, applaud for the panel, please. So welcome and thank you Uppsala Art Museum and Rebecca for inviting me as a moderator for this panel discussion on evolution and the aesthetics of resistance. Uh, you heard a brief introduction of Lundahl and Saito. Uh, they have been an artist duo formed in 2003, based in Stockholm and London. They perform, uh, teach and play with uh, choreography, VR architecture and exhibition format. Uh, with a background in visual arts, Christer Lundahl, and uh, choreography, Martina Seitel, they discover immersive states as uh, uh, philosophical tools to observe the boundaries and connections between the living, different objects and technologies, places and environments. Symphony of a Missing Room has since the first collaboration with Veld at National Museum 2009 developed into a far-reaching examination of different museum rooms and various works of art. Time and evolution are the basics of the composition that reflects on the museum as a phenomenon, the heritage, but also a possible future. Two participants experience involution at the same time. Both of them wear headphones with different sound and voices which create a choreography between the participations. One uh, has a couple of sightless Googles and the other is the leader. The blackout experience leads you to turn inside your own mind. With a three-dimensional sound in your headphones, you are present elsewhere. You no longer see the physical space, but you feel like you're in a room. <coughs> and you put your trust in the leader. A tracking technology that you carry on your body causes a light beam, light beam to be thrown against a wall wherever you turn. Shadow speeches from the altar priest of Pergamon as if they were invisible in the room. This light projection is something uh, that the leader and passing visitors can experience as an outside scene and create a relationship between the person being led around in the room. The title of the work and concept of involution refers partly to how people and other life forms participate in each other's lives. 
and together find new ways to live with each other through effective relationship rather than competition. It can also be understood as a kind of opposite of evolution. The concept of involution is applied, for example, by ecofeminist theorist Natasha Meyersand and Carla Hestak to highlight evolution steaming from affective relationship between species rather than competition. Involution can be understood as something rolling, unfolding in itself, bringing together species so that new living conditions can arise. The work Involution is inspired by Peter Weiss' book, The Aesthetics of Resistance, set in 1937. Covering the time from 1930s to the World War II, uh, this historical novel dramatized anti-fascist resistance. Living in Berlin in 1937, the unnamed narrator and his associates, 16 and 7 year old working class student, um, explore ways to express their hatred for the Nazi regime. They meet in museums and galleries, and in their conversation, they explore the affinity between politic resistance and, and art. In the opening scene of the book, the three men stand before Pergamon altar in Berlin, showing bloody bat battles scenes when Greek gods attack giants whose bodies are portrayed as serpent, slime, and other animals. Weiss and Lundal and Seitel share a method, a narrative approach, commonly referred as ekphasis, which can be described as a vivid, often dramatic, verbal description of a work of art, either real or imagined. By immersive uh, depictions of subject, the viewer's position is moved between looking at a work of art from a distance or being placed in the middle of the subject's course of event. So I first uh, will ask Stefan Johansson. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your experience of involution and how it refers to Peter Weiss' book, The Aesthetics of Resistance, and also maybe a bit about the concept of resistance? Uh, yes. Um, <coughs> thank you. And thank you, Uppsala Art Museum, for, uh, for, um, for this conversation, and, and, uh, and even more to Uppsala Concert Museum and uh, Martina and Christer for, uh, for letting me see this fantastic work. I'm a bit overwhelmed still by the, uh, by the work. Uh, I think I, um, so uh, I'm going to say something about it, uh, but in a little while. And I was thinking that I would tell, start to tell you a little bit about Peter Weiss and, and, um, and then move slowly to, uh, to the involution. If I understand it, uh, we were going to give small introductory uh, kinds. Uh, so so what I'm, what I'm going to do is to, um, when Rebecca invited me, I was just finishing this essay on Peter Weiss and the artwork and the ekphrastic uh, scenes in this novel, The Aesthetics of Resistance. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, two pages from that, and then you will see how Peter Weiss creates the effect of how you immerse yourselves into uh, artworks. And then we can speak about what kind of resistance that, that leads to and, and resistance that, that enables. Um, so, um, at the end of the first volume, the one we have here in, in English translation, and these novels came out, they came out in Swedish, in Swedish in 1975, 78 and 80, and around the same time in German. Uh, or they came out almost simultaneously in both languages, thanks to Ulrika Waldenström, who did the Swedish translation. So Peter Weiss sat in Stockholm, uh, wrote these, uh, they came out in Germany, and then they came out at uh, the publishing house Arbeta Kultur in Stockholm in, in, at, at the end of the 70s. At the end of this first volume, 
the protagonist, the, the narrator, he runs into a friend who is called Eichmann outside the cathedral in Valencia. They are volunteers in the Spanish Civil War and they have just received notice of the demob demobilization of the international brigades, which is an ominous sign of the approaching collapse of Comintern's popular front and the defeat of the Spanish Republic by the fascist forces. Now Eichmann, he's carrying a package of books and journals under his arm, which he has purchased in a second-hand bookstore, and he's very eager to show these art books to his friend. So they head, sort of, they walk toward the outskirts of Valencia, the city. They sit down in the shade of orange trees, and soon they are absorbed, absorbed by an issue of uh, the French art journal Cahiers d'Art, which features Picasso's Guernica. The magazine carries reproductions and preparatory sketches, as well as photographs documenting the execution of the painting, which happened in the spring, in May and June 1937, for the International Exposition in Paris that in that same summer. Uh, the completed image, which measures no less than 3.5 by 7.8 meters, it is reproduced in the journal. And the narrator informs us that is reproduced as an insert, which could be folded out. And it enabled us to visualize the painting in its gray and swarthy tones. So that's what Weiss writes then is the novel. And then what happens then is that the narration then moves to sort of mimic the printed matter of this magazine. And it opens a kind of virtual fold out of s over several pages of the novel that describes Picasso's image in great detail. And then it seamlessly moves on to account for the pred predicament of the Spanish Republic, the international brigades, and the political hope and despair of, of Vice's protagonists. So what begins as an examination of figures and forms in Picasso's Guernica, it concludes with an evocation of the painting's reference to the agonizing experience of the young fighters at the battlefront. Picasso has made visual their struggle. Quote, Spain continued what the Madrid insurgent, insurgents had begun in, 18, in 1808, the French revolutionaries in 1830, the Comenards and the October fighters. All those th things, the mighty rising and the foundering, the sinking and the gathering for a new thrust were contained in the huge picture of Guernica. So in this way, Weiss's novel renders Picasso's late cubist panorama, first as a formal montage, second as an index to real events and not just the German air raid on Guernica, but also to similar acts of brutality throughout history and then finally, as a historical ontology, uh, kind of the periodic thrust to break free from oppression. And then this passage continues with descriptions of Delacroix, liberty leading the, pay, the, the, liberty leading the people, and then to Guericault's uh, The Raft of the Meduse. And what is interesting there is that then this raft of the news, that's the, that's the big painting by Guericault, you all know it, of the, this raft with uh, people who are half dead and some of them are living and they are drifting you know, on the Atlantic. They have been abandoned by their superiors uh, and left to float because, uh, because uh, the ship had uh, run aground near the African coast. Um, and the narrator, he is very, he's caught by Guericault's excruciating efforts to identify with these shipwrecked people on the raft. And how Guericault renders what he calls the precise instant of indivisibility and finality in which the group on the raft, in defiance of their gruesome situation, 
appear as a collective embodiment of resistance. And here comes another quote from Weizmann. More and more, the raft became his world, Jericho's world. He attempted to imagine what it was like, the sinking of teeth into the throat, into the leg of a dead human being. And the narrator continues, without living through those 13 days and nights of anguish, Gerico wouldn't have been able to find that moment of finality and depict the remaining group in its indivis in indivisibility. So this is how Weiss imagines how Gerico actually lives through 13 days, just the 13 days that the people on the raft also lived through in his own studio when he makes that painting. Uh, these these, uh, what we should call these ekphrastic sections of the, of the aesthetics of resistance, they are very important because what they allow Weiss to do is that they, they allow him to bring time and identification and immersion into the novel, into this narrative. The narrative was going to the first project for this novel uh, was much more simple than what became the result. It was, he was going, Weiss was going to write a novel, documentary novel, based on interviews with, with people who, sur who had survived the resistance, uh, the anti-Nazi resistance in Stockholm. The novel was going to be called Resistance. And he went around talking to us or exiled expat Germans who had been there through since the war. And, um, but he was struggling to get some kind of form and shape to this material and how to make this past relevant to the present. And how, so how do you make that resistance of only three, four decades behind you? How do you make it relevant for the now? And then he made this trip to Berlin and he stood before the Pergamon altar, the Pergamon frieze. And there he looked at that Pergamon frieze and it's sort of, that is what Peter Weiss, he said, it's the ur, ur erlebnis, the original, originary sensation that makes, that makes his novel hang together. Because in that 2,200 year old sculpture, he sees his own present. He sees the class struggle. And he sees this thrust for freedom and the lion's paw that, that tries to grasp that freedom. And then he knows how to bring history into the novel uh, by introducing these immersive sections about artworks the intense description of an artwork, because these artworks are like holes in time or doors where you can enter a different time. And that's the way they work in the novel. They, they op you open a door and then you are in some kind of a temporal struggle, some a temporal idea about resistance and freedom. And that is when he find that, finds that out, he also changes the title of the book and it becomes The Aesthetics of Resistance. So I think I begin there and then, then we can, uh, can move to your immersive work and resistance later. Thank you so much for that introduction to the Peter Weiss book, The Aesthetics of Resistance. And that interesting thought of imagining by getting involved in art. It's really strong. So we go over to Devin Suber. Can you tell me a bit about uh, maybe your experience and uh, uh, your thoughts of uh, ekphasis as a concept in relation to the work? Sure. And just to join the chorus, warm thanks for the invitation to be here, Rebecca and Christian Martina. It's a great pleasure. And I find it striking that we're here in conversation together and in dialogue around an artwork that facilitates and encourages a kind of dialectic co-construction of meaning. So it's lovely after 
the duress of COVID to be here in conversation about this. So my background's in literature and literary theory, and I have a particular interest in the environment, in eco-criticism or ecological criticism. So some of the things I'll have to say now are in view of that, uh, and I'll mix it in with my own reaction to the work. I did have the pleasure of experiencing uh, Symphony for a Missing Room, I think in 2017 for the first time in Stockholm with Krista and Martina. So I was delighted to come here and see a further expansion of this idea. And I undertook it with Susanna, our um, moderator for the evening. And this work for me has at its heart a tension, a resistance between the individual and the collective. And I think this is also one reason why Pedro Weiss's novel is a very important paratext for it. And my experience with Susanna sort of began with that. Someone I had just met, a total stranger, and being put into a situation without giving anything away about the artwork, because you have to experience this yourself, uh, of being willing to let go of inhibitions one has and to trust in the experience and in a total stranger who would be there. Um, so that's, that was my first uh, thought about the resistance. It's, it's embodied and it's also about uh, public trust in a stranger. And for me, let me say some words here about the collectivity the work facilitates um, in terms of thinking about the environment and larger structures of time. Beyond the political and Peter Weiss's novel, which Stefan is an expert on here, uh, is so embedded in questions of art and politics of its time. I'm interested in how involution evokes the deep time of, of evolution, of species history. And that is another kind of tension and resistance with, with perhaps the political. Um, just as the work delicately evokes species history, and I would argue it, it it does that in a way that's not didactic. You feel it in your body. There's an attempt to instill a sense that we are geology, fossils, our teeth, our bones were made to feel this in the artwork. There's another time frame that's very old here, and that's through this uh, genre of ekphrasis. Um, let me say a few words about that and weave it back into to some concerns about the environment. This is very old literary rhetorical devices. Um, in a way, it goes back to the classical foundations of Western literature. One of the earliest examples of ekphrasis is in Homer, in the famous moment where Homer describes the shield of Achilles that's given to Achilles in a battle. And already there, we have something funny happening with time where the ekphrastic mode is not just rich description of something that is seen, but it's focusing on a representation, on an artwork, on a moment in time that is frozen as an image that the words then bring to life. Some critics have talked about that moment in Homer as proto-cinematic because the reading of the long, lush description of everything that is engraved on the shield from Achilles brings the images to life. I think it's relevant to notice too that even though this is not an inflection point in Christopher and Martina's work, it's a scene of violence and conflict. So the very first example of Ekaphrasis is uh, entangled in um, questions of war and human culture, society, and the law. Ekaphrasis has a very long shelf life. It really goes through a profound renaissance in the 20th century and I, I would posit that P Peter Weiss's novel is part of a larger zeitgeist uh, in several different literary contexts where this mode of poetically turning towards visual art and, and expanding on it is a major device. And perhaps there's, there's two remarks there to say. One might be why, why does painting, why do the visual arts become such an important mode for for literature. The 20th century is the age of the image, a frenzy of the visible, to quote 
uh, an art historian on it. So perhaps that's one reason why um, literature turns towards the image in a certain way. I think Weiss and others of his moment mid-century are responding clearly to the trauma of the war and World War II. And there was a prophetic stillness in the painted image that poets and writers turn to. Uh, my own background is American and English literature. Here I'm thinking of uh, Auden in his poems about the fall of Icarus by Bruegel, or William Carlos Williams, who responds to the same paintings. Maybe you know those. So um, obviously the work here in the Uppsala Museum of Art that Krister and Martina uh, have, have put on is not referring to the trauma of World War II. But for me, as a Californian, having lived through yet another season of wildfire and climactic disaster on my doorstep, it's hard not to be thinking about another serious crisis, the planetary crisis that, that faces us. And that's where I think the, the invocations of deep time this work does, which marvelously, even though there's sort of a dematerialization um, a lack of a there there in this piece. It's all inside you in the words that you hear and the movements you're, you're, you're taken through. There's a very important preoccupation with the materiality of both the original Pergamon frieze and how it's read by, by Peter Weiss in his novel and our bodily connection to that substrate of sculptural materials that was shaped over millions of years and, and, and millennia and that's where, to wrap this up, uh, my, my introductory comments, I find the feeling of collectivity the work ideally creates to be so profound because of anything that comes out of reflecting on where we are as, as a planet, as a species, it's about the spectacular failure of our individual notion that we are alone. And this is a, a work of art that reminds us we are together, we are connected, and we are matter and, and entangled in matter. Maybe I'll hold off from saying more about this. I, I would love to maybe think about the importance of material entanglements and also the way Peter Weiss's novel chooses to read certain parts of the Pergamon frieze in terms of identification with the children of the earth, the figure of Gaia, that seems to be another important level to the work. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and we can build the conversation around that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Devin. And uh, we now had an um, introduction to Ekphasis uh, and your experience, your own experience of the work in Lucian. And Martina and Christer, uh, you now heard Stefan and Devin's reflections on your work in Volution. So I leave the word to you. Uh, and I'm really interested in your artistic method, but also your reflections on their reflections. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for these reflections. Uh, I feel my mind is totally filled with thoughts at the moment that I need to digest. And um, yeah, so I mean, Krista, please interrupt me if there is anything, you know, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, to respond to your question um, about artistic methods. So I think we're going to focus on the uh, choreographic approach uh, to the work. And uh, so what happens, you know, wh when you work choreographically is that you, you bring a, an idea and you bring a concept and you, you bring that into your studio. And then what happens when you start to embody something is that it's totally inevitable um, that this uh, idea uh, exists outside of time. So you have to, whatever you do in the studio, it has a beginning and a middle and an end. So, if, for example, if you take the concept 
the idea of uh, and action of resistance, it's immediately placed into time axis. And then when you have the time axis, you also have an oscillation and a fluctuation. So it, you will discover by working with it physically that, oh, okay, so here there's more resistance here, there's less, you can't maintain the same kind of volume for a longer time. And uh, I guess this is what I, in a way, uh, like about the, uh, um, the choreographic uh, working method, because I think what it does for me is often that it turns my kind of ideas a little bit upside down. I'm often quite surprised uh, when I go into the studio. I'm not sure I always agree with um, what we find, but uh, it also makes my, I guess, world less uh, black and white, and it helps my mind to uh, depolarize a bit. Uh, and it gives some sort of multi-layer to a concept, and but it also simplifies it in, in, in a way. And in involution, as you mentioned, Suzanne, um, is that you're not experiencing this on your own. Uh, you share this experience with another visitor. And pre in our previous work, as you mentioned, uh, Devin, Symphony of a Missing Room, you experienced this together uh, with the performer. But this time it was very important that the other person is another visitor. So we wanted to bring equal grounds into these two visitors that enter the work. There's no one that knows more about the work than the other one. And, um, and then also, if we then kind of start to use resistance physically, uh, I'm also aware as a participant that my lack of resistance or my ability to resist will affect the other person. I'm suddenly overwhelmed by a maybe possibly a responsibility for the other person's experience. And, uh, and also maybe the insight that uh, rem remaining an equal amount of resistance might not always be the thing to do. Sometimes we also, in the work, need to support the other person to resist. This is something we discovered, like when is the right time to resist? Maybe I'm not the appropriate subject to resist this time. I need to support someone else to do that. And maybe this is maybe most kind of shown there's um, a moment in the work when the two visitors kind of use each other's weight and they have to kind of navigate the choreography of gravity and sensing the balance together. This is a lot of things are happening here and actually the ability to sense balance is something that evolved um, through the Nidarians, which is uh, the corals already have this sort of, it's a very old sense. Um, and uh, also something I think you mentioned, Devin, that um, the struggle between the individual and the collective is interesting. The reason why I thought of that is also that a lot of people that have come out of the work has kind of reflected a lot upon, oh, this is how it feels to be in a relationship. Actually, the way you struggle uh, for your own self, for your individuality. Uh, and then how do you compromise for the other, which of course also can be extended with how the individual is kind of relating uh, and struggling with the collective. And, uh, and then maybe then I would like to maybe also explain, if I know the answer, why I do keep insisting then on the importance uh, of the bodily approach to this. And I think maybe the reason is that perhaps uh, this simple experience of having a body is actually what we know that we share with other non-human living organisms. Because even bacteria has a simple way of sensing and uh, also just single cells uh, that are not part of an animal have also a very uh, a sensory ability. Uh, but then, of course, a cell might not be <laughs> able to study the lures, but like us, they can uh, sense things. And I think this is inspired by, oh, you have the book. Um, uh, so it's called Other Minds. It's been an inspiration as well as Peter Weiss' book. It's by Peter Godfrey Smith. And um, he, a quote from him is, we must continually avoid falling into the habit that all forms of experience must be human. And, and with this, I would like to maybe end for me and then, you know, go over to you. But uh, I would like to just give the octopus as an example because um, octopus, they diverted very early from the human or the mama mammalian branch in evolution. Uh, but they became really and um, very intelligent. So he describes like if you meet an octopus, it's the closest you come to meeting um, an alien. 
their brains are very different. I mean, they have a um, totally different structure of the brain. It's decentralized, so the brain is as much in the tentacles as it is uh, in their head. And uh, sometimes those tentacles operate uh, independently. Um, but of course, no one knows how it feels to be uh, an octopus. But um, I guess in evolution, um, you lose your vision at times because you're wearing the goggles, so you're wearing a blindfold. And then sometimes when you are excluding the vision, it might activate more kind of a primitive uh, motion in your hands and arms and feet that also that you did not intend to do and that you're not even aware of and conscious. And there's something about this maybe messiness um, that things are not always so thought maybe through in this action is something that attracts me, especially when watching maybe the work from the outside. Um, sorry, I may be too long. Maybe you... Yes. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, maybe I um, um, <coughs> hook on to the, the image of the octopus. Um, just thinking about when you talk about that, I mean, maybe it's a good sort of... Um, example for how in the space uh, of that we have created up there in the exhibition uh, where we show the work involution that sort of the visitors the participants there their senses is somewhat distributed uh, uh, throughout each other but also they are also st the, the, their senses is somewhat also distributed into the room because um, the person that doesn't see anything there, the shadows of the objects that they should have seen if they would be inside the VR goggles that now are on the floor, they are now, they're now seeing the shadows of these objects on the wall. For, the, for those who haven't experienced the piece, that might sound a bit uh, complicated, but I'm thinking um, this whole thing about um, having a body and, and uh, like, like the octopus, I think people speculating if they have a proprioception, like if they can feel their body without looking at their, their parts, so they're somewhat uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a bit uncertain about that, but I'm, I'm thinking uh, this thing about having to, um, uh, uh, to under, um, um, I think what we have done with this piece, Involution, that we insisted to bring, um, to, to, to let um, what the piece is, uh, to talk about things that is in the room, or to, to, to really put in, into attention um, Things like uh, that you that you have physically there in the room, either as a sensation, an experience, or so an object that we can see in the room. So, um, uh, and 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 one of one of those objects is of course perception, and another is technology, because the faci facilitating medium of making the piece and what makes you have um, maybe experiences of a reality that is not your normal experience of reality. It is the use of technology, and, and, and uh, the technology, I mean also the sort of block of vision in order to focus on other things. Um, and I think if this work, as I see it, uh, is political in any way, it's sort of, of uh, our insistence of using not continue using technology, but in a, not in the way that it was uh, made to be used. And also, um, why we are constantly c insisting on making immersive work uh, or like making work where uh, a visitor is sort of embedded in the work that is that they also experiencing experiencing they they're partly producing the artwork but also experiencing the artwork it's somewhat i mean today um, we we use technology in, in, in every day we are so dependent on especially uh, during the covid pandemic um, and it's very um, it's very hard to sort of step out of that without losing your social connection to everyone that is important for you. Um, uh, but still, we are not so aware of maybe how it affects us, how it is affects our behavior, but also our actions, what we do. And, and bringing people within their experience of um, and being maybe aware how um, uh, your reality is as much a projection out as it is a, a, a sort of something that flows into you. Uh, it makes, possibly can make people aware of also their own capacity, perhaps. But at the same time, also that it's quite good to be maybe prepared that uh, things that you're exposed to is not always a good thing. 
So we are, that you become vigilant towards uh, um, uh, also the manipulation of, of the world through technologies or other, other ways. And I, I'm not sure if this, this piece is uh, not maybe your ordinary piece that is like a, um, um, that shows some um, conflict outside of, of, of the exhibition room, like that is not, it's not showing a precise thing that we are uh, um, um, making a commentary on and so on. But I think what uh, I think the piece brings maybe back um, focus on, on what's going on in everyday, day-to-day uh, -day experience in life, like how, how we are like basically um, these conflicts that we deal with, with emotions and so on. I think that's sort of something that it's... Mm. Thank you, Christer. I've, um, it was so nice to hear you talk about resistance as a geography in your work, and I think that's a, a centerpiece of the work. Um, and I also think that art about resistance and politic, it cannot have a ready-made idea. And, uh, but however, uh, we can invite visitors to reflect on the surroundings and find resistance. And I wonder, when you heard uh, uh, Stefan and Devin, when you heard this central talk about resistance and choreography, uh, do you have any reflections on the resistance in in uh, evolution? Um, I, I I can say uh, a couple of things. Uh, maybe I think. Um, Like, like many uh, successful artworks, this is this is, a, and I think this is a very successful artwork. Uh, it it sort of teaches the viewer something about themselves, uh, in the sense that it it leads, this, this work leads to a discovery, I, and I think we all talked about it, it leads to a discovery of um, your dependence on the other. I mean, I think mm -hmm. this is the most obvious and, and, and kind of explicit part of this work, that you are interacting, two people are interacting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very, um <coughs> but you're not just interacting, but you're sort of also following a script so you also have to trust that voice. I don't know how many have been in this artwork, uh, by the way, but, but and it's, I, I found it, I, I, I find it almost <laughs> impossible to, to, to describe this artwork because it's, it's, so for those of you who haven't, haven't been sort of inside it, and by the way, that was the first thing that struck me. Have you, that's what you, how you were talking about the artwork. Have you been inside it? So those of you have, who haven't been inside it, I would encourage you to do to go inside it, uh, but because it's very hard to to um, to um, I mean describe that experience of being inside this artwork because it's 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 complex, and I think the main so the main thing would be that relationship that you interact with another uh, one. I guess it's your partner, typically, if you go to this museum together with someone, but we did it together and we were strangers. So if you do it with a stranger, it's even stronger. Um, and you, so, and, and that, that relationship in itself leads to a discovery of self, but also of the other, and thereby a lesson in that you can't really have a self without the other. Um, so that's number one, but then it's this voice. I don't know whose voice that was, but it's in your headphones, and that voice is guiding you. Uh, and it's very soft, and it's very beautiful. And it's kind of uh, egging in a certain way. It's almost like a sexual voice that, that, that encourages you to, do, to walk over with your Google Son blind and just take someone's arm. So it's very, it's, it's very, uh, not sexual, erotic. It's very erot er an erotic voice in that sense. Uh, so it's very physical. Uh, and this together with then that you actually do certain uh, 
there is a choreography that you perform under the guidance of this voice. Um, that is also very, uh, and that's where the resistance of the other comes. But then you feel that the resistance of the other is really not a resistant, but it's, it's a working together. Because you do, you, 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 it's like you lean back, you hold each other. So it's not, it's not so much, I mean, resistance, yes, because you are asked to resist the, the, the hand of the other and pull, and pull back. But in doing that, you cooperate. So it's also about cooperation and collectivity. Uh, and then, uh, so this is, this is one layer. And then the other layer is this the temporal layer that you have been inside and doing this. There, and, and that, I, I, I can't really explain that, but there is some kind of combination of effects that you get between your sensory experiences and your cooperation with the other and time. Time and these fossils and, 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 and the geological and the deep history or deep temporality in this. I can't really explain, but maybe I would uh, send that on to Devin then and <laughs> to, to say, ask about, I mean, how, what do you think about this, this question between because something happens with your senses and you, f you actually feel that you are, you don't really feel that, but I think the, the, the idea is that you, f and you feel a little bit of it, that you should feel almost like a rock, almost like dead, almost like a fossil. So it, the works tries to transform you into a fossil, but the kind of living one. But, but and so something happens with the sensory experience and this, t this idea of time. And I think it has to do with this narrative voice, this, because there is a story in this too. But anyway, I'll stop there. Yes, uh, well, the emotions that we are into now, describing the emotions when you're involved in evolution, uh, they, can be they can almost be described as a bridge uh, between the different positions and the choice of the beholder's affect. Traditionally, physical affects and emotion in an art discourse have been difficult to analyze, but that's what we are doing today. We are talking about emotion and affects and the po importance and central questions of them in evolution. So in a way we are breaking new grounds or you are breaking new grounds with your work. So, do you have anything to add, Devin, on Stefan's uh, uh, reflections on his um, emotions? Yeah, um, I'm thinking of the voice too, and uh, I'm thinking of your remark, Suzanne, about um, affect and emotion, which have not always been central in aesthetic experience in contemporary art. Um, or seen as adjacent or not central to a message. In our highly technocratic secular societies, we so very rarely encounter alterity, radical otherness that displaces our sense of self. Once upon a time, this was the effective space that collective religion could provide where other voices spoke to you or were received as revelation with, with certain scripts. So I think this work wonderfully you know, opens up the possibility of do you, do you listen to this voice inside your head that's telling you to do certain things? Like this is a central problematic for the history of religion um, or the afterlife of religion in our secular postmodern culture. So I think there's a, there's a wonderful play with that. I'll add on another part of this piece, which I haven't mentioned in my own experience of it, which was really profound and striking, was to watch it after I had gone through it as a participant, as an outsider. And it's very beautiful once you've understood the choreography and the narrative that unfolds to see others experiencing it for the first time. There's a, um, a visual dimension that this inner, intersubjective experience between two people becomes visualized 
on the wall. And I, I can't help but think, as I, as I saw it from a certain perspective, as the resistance and the movement of the bodies correlates into images that are projected on a wall, you very deftly evoke a history of Platonic philosophy, shadows on the wall of a cave, and also the history of art. It's hard not to see in some of those animal figures that fade in and out of focus, cave art and sort of the origins of, of, um, of representation, of freezing a moment in time and trying through the aesthetic to create an experience for the participant and viewer. And I watched a couple, an, an older couple do it, and it was, it was very delicate. It just, it showed me how this work is open-ended. Every time it is experienced by two people, whether they're strangers or a couple, it will produce a different result, um, literally, in, in how the, the play of shadow and light and projection works in the wall. So that's, that's really, really marvelous and makes it something one can return to again and again. Thank you very much. I think that uh, I know that a couple of you in the audience also have been um, in the artwork of Involution. So I suggest that we let you in if you have any questions to add to this conversation. Anyone? Perhaps not a question, but a reflection. Uh, I just, I was in the piece. Uh, thank you for making me part of this as a spectator or visitor. Um, and I had some reflections about the trust um, and um, the multiple perspectives that you get uh, as a visitor here. Um, because I think that that is the biggest difference between this piece and your earlier works, that it's the shifting of perspectives between the, the two persons that are doing this, but also the possibility of, of seeing it uh, from outside. So you get the different perspectives um, in multiple ways here. Um, and also perhaps the responsibility we talked about that being a big, big thing for us when we did it. Um, because, I mean, the, the ultimate way of showing resistance here would perhaps be to not do the piece, because here you're following it, you're, you're following instructions in a way, but then you have the responsibility for another person, and uh, it's so dependent on if you guide that person the right way. And so I think that that's the beautiful part of this piece. It's, it's very much about taking care of someone else. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you so much for that reflection. Uh, does anyone else? Well, actually, I, I think I want to maybe continue what Olga is saying, um, because we did it together. But I think there is an interesting parallel to the fact that you're talking about this resistance that actually is also a way to collaborate. Um, but what does this mean also, I think, for your working method? Because in other pieces, you always have performers that somehow can either, I don't know, maybe save the idea that you have so that you can come in and correct if some of the, the, the viewers or the experiencers are not maybe following the choreography as you were planning it out. But here, you're kind of letting go as well um, because you're not there to do that in this case because it's, it was up to Olga and me to guide each other. So that it's like really you've been kind of taking your own working method, I think, in a new way. And a question may be there. It's both a reflection but also a question uh, how has that been, and have you had to work in a different way um, to I let go I, yeah. in that sense? I think so. I mean, it's uh, of course, there were stages in the process where um, it was very difficult uh, to let go of that, because being used to work with um, performers that have been trained for years to kind of embody architecture, they, they've been trained to respond to different uh, physical responses and are experts at the unexpected. Uh, so I think what we had to do, it was a different solution. We had to kind of almost, 
I think it was when we started building the resistance into the work itself, it became more natural and allowing what was going to the actual because normally when you this is a natural reaction obviously when you are blindfolded and you have to follow a hand of maybe a person you never seen or know you will your body will in some way actually resist so uh, so but if that is actually built into the choreography it's kind of it gives you space to f to have that resistance within you it's a natural reaction i think so yeah and also i, c I guess um i would like to reflect on the dependency on each other and how that relates to the visual because um, one person is blindfolded and one person is seeing and but the the paradox is that the person that is blindfolded wears a tracker that actually steers what part of the freeze that you will see but you that have the tracker cannot see that yourself which in a way one could say that the person that leads a blindfolded um, uses the other person as their eyes it's your vision so it's so it's also kind of how do you work that out is that does that kind of other body become become an extension of your uh, own body or do you of yourself of your own needs or do you actually start to reflect that maybe they are in a diff totally different world i don't know what they are hearing and which they are they are um, they have a totally different uh, immersive approach to where they are. So how much do I kind of consider that? How easy is it to forget that aspect? Thank you so much. Do we have any other reflections or questions? Yes, please. Thank you, and thank you so much for this very interesting discussion. Uh, you, you have mentioned being inside this uh, artwork and um, normally you you say that you look at a piece of art or you perhaps listen to it or, or you touch it perhaps um, but referring to to the mentioning of, of artworks in in the aesthetics of the resistance and and and, and in homer as you did uh, is it is it correct that you sort of give us the idea that you are always inside uh, an artwork in some way and, and let it uh, have an impact on you and, 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 uh, and on, on others around you. And that uh, in, in this piece of art, you have just made it sort of more visible than usually. Is that, uh, could you comment on that? <coughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's kind of, kind of what it is uh, in one way. Uh, of course, we are always, when we are look at something, you're somewhat always making an internal copy of that. Uh, here, here, though, um, we have kind of um, consciously left sort of gaps within the artwork. Uh, and also, if uh, things would be appearing very fragmented if no one would be uh, entering the artwork. It's really connected by the passage through the artwork uh, and how things are unfolding because you are there and, and maybe experience it with your body. And because, you know, uh, f for example, there is the um, vibrations of that belt that corresponds with the heartbeat of someone else standing in front of you uh, or um, the movement uh, that you do uh, on the other person that has the sightless goggles on is corresponded by the the, the change of shadows on the wall. So all of those things are like this web of different uh, events that is then connected by you being there uh, as a conscious human being. And you become maybe aware of that. <coughs> you cre create this coherent experience just by being in the middle of the action. You're being embedded in the work. I think that's maybe what separates this type of work with an, like an object-based work. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, yes, I think that your thoughts and the difference is also um, really interesting aspects of the bodily affect that you talked about, that it's actually connecting to your body, that you feel the work in your body 
and you feel the hands touching you and you move around in the room. And uh, uh, so for you, so for you who hasn't experienced this, I highly recommend to do it before uh, the closing of the exhibition. And so I think we will have to uh, close up this panel discussion and conversation. So very much thank to Devin and Stefan for coming here to Uppsala Art Museum tonight and sharing your reflections on evolution in relation to your own uh, research practice. And thank you, Rebecca, for inviting and initiating this conversation. And uh, thank you, audience, for coming here. It's so nice to be able to meet you in physics again. <laughs>